Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. May I walked in today, the trouble, some situations of life, the hurt, maybe there's marriage problems, maybe financial problems. The world's getting crazy and it's getting wicked. And this morning in prayer, I was, I was thinking about, and I was just thinking about what's going on. And the scripture said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And all the things that the world goes through, there's something that they don't have. They don't have the spirit of God living inside like we do. They don't have the true peace. And I know sometimes God's people, we live out in that world and we, we experience And Yes, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. But we have something that they don't have. And I know sometimes in our mind and sometimes in the way we feel, yes, God, I know you're real, but where, in this situation, where are you? But sometimes we got to push the emotions aside. It's not how we feel, but it's, we've got to base on the revelation and the word of God of who God is. He's still the king of kings. He's still the Lord of lords. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. It don't matter what the situation is. It don't matter what the world says. But we base our belief off the word of God and who he is. And so today, I think it's only proper and fitting that we just lift our hands to the Lord before the music, before anything else. And let's just lift up the name of Jesus. Come on, remember the things that he's doing and what he's going to continue doing. He's the protection. He's the strong tower. He's the strength. Come on, he's our salvation. There is no other name by which we are saved, but by the name of Jesus. Lord, whatever you want today, but we exalt you today, Jesus. We acknowledge you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we lift you up today, Jesus. If you have the Holy Ghost, why don't you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost today? Why don't we stir up the Spirit today inside that gift that God has given you to help you through the times of life? Oh, yes, his ear is open to the righteous. Oh, yes, Lord, hide not thy face from thee, O God, but look upon your people with favor today. Come down and visit with us today, God. We hunger, we desire to feel your presence. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, oh, we love you, Jesus. There is nobody like you, Jesus. I put my faith and my trust in you today, God. Oh, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is nobody like you, Lord. There is nobody like you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. As the praise team comes, let's continue to lift up the name of Jesus. There is nobody like Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't feel to start 
the song just yet. I feel the Lord moving right now and the, His presence is here. Why don't we just plug in and get a hold of Him right now? Hallelujah, Jesus. We glorify You. We worship You, Jesus. We praise Your name this morning, God. There's nobody like You. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Who's ready to worship him this morning? Hallelujah. Amen. Why don't you put your hands together and worship with us?
Hallelujah, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I know a name that's stronger than any other name. It's the word I run and I say there is just one Everything's going to be okay. Everything is going to be all right. Hallelujah. Why don't we lift our hands and worship him this morning, Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus And I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadow. the holy name Jesus oh, oh Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets Jesus over every enemy oh and Jesus for the
every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Hallelujah. All across the house, can we exalt that wonderful, that wonderful, precious, holy name? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. I think the name of Jesus deserves better than that. Would you give the name of Jesus your very best praise, your very best hand clap, your very best shout this morning? Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you notice, the last two songs spoke specifically about the deliverance of the mind. Anxiety, depression, and I could feel that in the house this morning. And the cross of Jesus Christ was supposed to do a lot more than just grant you a free ticket into heaven. But he came to give you deliverance over every. Come on, I said he came to give you deliverance over every. Not just your spirit, but in your mind as well. Woo, shata la buhuta. I feel something wants to break on that this morning. And so we're not going to single anybody out today. I'm just going to ask that everybody would close their eyes and lift their hands. Because living in this media-saturated society, there's probably not a little bit of someone in everybody that has the battle of the mind that we're struggling with. I feel like God wants us to give a deliverance right now. Every hand in the building. Every hand in the building. Now just begin to lift your voice. He called. That's it. Come on. Let it break. Just let it break. He called. Come on. Don't hold it back. Let it break. Come on. Let the peace of God wash over your mind. He shandalabo. Rabba. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke anxiety. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke depression. Hatalabo. Hashandaha. Hallelujah. I don't feel released to move on. Would you put your arm around your neighbor if it's appropriate? You don't know what the person next to you is going through. You don't know the contemplations they had this morning before they walked into church and the premeditated decisions they already made about their life. And they said, I'm going to go to church one more time and see if God... You never know who you're standing next to. So why don't you put your arm around them? Why don't you begin to pray for them? Why don't you begin to pray over their mind? He taught... Lord, touch my neighbor. Lord, I pray you do a work in their life. Whatever they came in with, whatever they walked in struggling with, I pray they leave with victory. I pray they leave with victory. I pray they leave with victory. Let them have dominion in the mind. Let the peace of God settle over their thoughts. Hallelujah. We tear down every stronghold. We cast down every imagination. Come on, that's it. You feel it breaking right now.
Hallelujah. Now as an act of praise and thanksgiving, would you put your hands together all across the building and just begin to thank the Lord that he's doing the work in your mind. Yes, all across the building, just begin to praise him in advance for what he's already done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Lord is good. We're going to go in now and pray for, uh, I'll pray our kingdom prayer. Amen. And pray that the same spirit that we feel here won't be relegated to these four walls, but that all of Stockton would be able to know that there is a God that can deliver them and give them victory over every area of life. And I'm believing that every time we pray this prayer, it makes a difference. Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you today. Father, we come before you on behalf of our city. Lord, we put Stockton before you one more time. God, we've been praying for over a decade for our city. God, I'm asking that you would compound every prayer from every service, from every individual. And hear it as one prayer this morning. Let the weight of all those prayers be heard in the throne room of heaven this morning. Father, I pray for my city. I pray that there would be a revival of righteousness, a revival of right living, Lord. I pray that you would touch every street. Let there be an anointing that flows down every street. God, I pray that it would go through the places of businesses. It would go to the high schools. Let us have great revival in our high schools and our junior high schools and our college campuses. Father, I pray that you would use the labors of Christian Life Center. Send them to their lost family and put the words in their mouth that need to be said. Give them wisdom when they're speaking to their backslidden family. God, I pray for divine unction would come upon them. That their words would be inspired by the Holy Ghost. Let it be more, God, than just reason. But let it be spirit anointing, God. I pray that we'd fill this building up with people who are hurting. People who are lost. Lord, that they would receive salvation. That these waters, not one service would go by without them being filled with people who need this new birth experience. We'll keep knocking, Lord. We'll keep asking till the rapture happens. We'll keep believing till it happens, God. We know you're a God that hears and answers our prayers. You're a good father, so we keep asking and we keep knocking and we keep believing. Thank you, Jesus. If you believe the Lord has heard your prayers, would you just give him one more hand clap? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You can make your way back to your places this morning. God is so good. Amen? Why don't you turn to two or three people and tell them, God is so good. Just a couple of quick announcements this morning. Uh, Everybody say, baby dedication. We have another one coming. We try to do this around four times a year. That's going to be April 21st. If you have a new baby that you want to dedicate to the Lord, and honestly, even if they're not a new baby, they're they're older, uh, but you've never dedicated them to the Lord. Uh, We don't baptize infants here at Christian Life Center. Uh, We want everything we do to be found in Scripture, and we don't find infant baptism in Scripture, but we do find that they dedicated babies to the Lord. Jesus himself was dedicated in the temple and so we follow after that pattern so if you want your child to be dedicated to the Lord please register at clministry.com backslash baby dedication get your baby's name in there so we can call them out we'll have a little gift for you when you come to the altar and all of our pastors will come and dedicate the baby but really what we're doing is we're not just dedicating babies but we're dedicating parents as well amen And so please, we want you to be a part of that. All the men, can you say men's conference? Brother Kenny, it's coming up. Amen. I don't see the fire suit quite yet, but I know it's coming up. Amen. That's going to be April 25th through the 27th, just a couple short weeks away. And the lineup is absolutely stacked. Brother McDonald, Brother Sanders, our very own Pastor Eli Lopez, 
and our very own Pastor Nathaniel Haney are going to be the it's going to be the lineup for our men's conference. You don't want to miss it. If you're sitting next to a man, why don't you just elbow him and tell him make sure you're going to men's conference. It is free admission. There is just no reason to not be there. There's tons of fellowships planned. We have day sessions. If you want to find out more, go on the website to see the full schedule. But it's going to be a wonderful time. Lastly, uh, but not leastly, Acts 29 Youth Camp. Always, always, always a highlight event. Not just for the youth, but for our whole church. Because the youth come back from youth camp so on fire for God. A little bit of that fire seems to overflow into the main church body as well. And so youth camp is always a wonderful time. Parents, I want to, I want to adjure you as someone who was on youth staff for almost 10 years. There is nothing like getting your kids to youth camp. Uh, it, it changes the course and direction of their entire life. Those moves of God, I still remember them. I'm sure many of you do as well. You don't want to miss it. Uh, space is going to fill up, so you want to register early. It's going to be June 3rd to the 7th at Old Oak Ranch, $330. If you want more information, please see the youth booth after service out to my left in this hallway over here. Everyone said praise the Lord. If we can all stand, we're going to take our Sunday morning tithe and offering. Amen. Let's try that one more time. The Lord loveth a cheerful giver. Amen. We're going to take our Sunday morning tithe and offering. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all read our declaration together. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Upon the authority of the word of God, we declare that the Lord is our provider. As one who ties and gives offerings, I am entitled to his blessings and protection from the attacks of the enemy. Therefore, I bring my tithe and offering into your storehouse today, knowing that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. For employees, we claim good jobs, raises, bonuses, sales and commissions, promotions and benefits, and favor with our employers and customers in the workplace. For business owners, we claim favorable contracts and growth, and that these businesses will be profitable and a blessing to the kingdom. For his people, the Lord shall supply income, inheritances, estates, interests, rebates, unexpected gifts and blessings. Bills and debts will be paid off, allowing me to live debt free. Since spiritual blessings follow the giver, I declare that my whole family is saved and in relationship with God. We receive perfect health, healing, deliverance, and walking in the divine favor and blessing of the Almighty. I am blessed coming in and going out. And all that I put my hand to do will prosper in Jesus' name. If you believe it, would you put your hands together? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you as you give this morning on the Lord for you to march. Now, can you don't wait on you.
Life Center, I'm going to encourage you one last time that we could stand all across the building. We just fellowship a little bit better when we're standing. What I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different and get your attention. I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different. Everyone look on your pew and look all the way down to the right. Okay. And then look down all the way to the left. And if there's anyone on your pew that you have not yet met and you don't know their name, before you go and start fellowshipping with all your friends, would you meet everybody on your pew, introduce yourself, ask them how they're doing today. Tell them how good it is to see them in the house of God. God bless you.
you could begin making it back to your places today. so good to see everybody in the house of God today and it is a sign of a healthy church of a healthy family when we enjoy fellowshipping with one another and this is one of the most beautiful parts of our service a tremendous worship today sister Puentes and the worship team tremendous job today so grateful Amen. and in my opinion there's nobody better then Pastor Ellis leading a service and appreciate his leadership of this service. Amen. And, uh, and then we come to this time of fellowship and it's just beautiful that we get to be a family and for a few moments in the midst of a very, very busy and chaotic world, we get to just, just be a family. And, and I think it's beautiful that one day we're going to spend forever in heaven together. And I'm thankful we get to enjoy the journey together down here. So God bless you, my brothers, my sisters. Let's thank God for the family of God today. Amen. As I look over the congregation today, I do see a number of guests, a number of visitors. We're so thankful to have you at Christian Life Center. Can we welcome all of our guests and our visitors to Christian Life Center today? Amen. And if you're here today as one of our brand new guests, we have a room called the Genesis Room. It is out the doors to my right in our south hallway. Uh, after service, if you'll just step out there, you'll see the sign says Genesis Room. Just step in the door there. Uh, our friendly staff and, and a couple pastors will be there to meet you and to get to know your name. And, and you can ask any questions you have about our ministry. Grab a cup of coffee, sit down. Uh, and just relax for a few moments. So we would love to welcome all of our guests and our visitors, visitors to the Genesis Room after service today. And I'm so thankful you're in the house of God today. Um, I, uh, I don't like winter. I, I, I endure winter to get to spring. And I really enjoy summer. Even these hot summers we have here in the valley. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy the summer months. Uh, and this rainstorm came back through, and I was about to get a really bad attitude, really bad attitude. And then I remembered the words of that great man of God, Brother Billy Cole. He said, rain is a sign of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. So God keeps sending the rain because we believe there's going to be a mighty Holy Ghost outpouring in Stockton, California. And I believe God's going to do a great work here today. Amen. It is our apostolic doctrine that gives us our apostolic identity let me say that again it is our apostolic doctrine that gives us our apostolic identity what we believe determines who we are and you didn't come to just another Christian church today you didn't come to just another Pentecostal church today you came to an apostolic church today. And in this service, we're going to celebrate our apostolic identity. Would you please stand with me for the reading of the word? I, it's not normally my custom to have you do that, but I would like for you to do that today. And we're going to turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, there's nothing more beautiful or few things more beautiful perhaps than the sound of the rustling pages of Bibles being turned. So if you have your Bible, 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 9, and we're going to look at a story that I think most of us are very, very familiar with. And in 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 9, so thankful to again stand in this pulpit. I give honor to our pastor. What a great man of God we have as our shepherd, pastor and sister Haney. And the entire Haney family, we're so thankful for their leadership. We, we are so privileged here at Christian Life Ministry to be under their leadership. So 
I'm so thankful to God. Second Kings chapter 5 and verse 9. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. We kind of know the, this, the background real fast. Uh, Naaman is a mighty man in, in the nation of Syria, but he has contracted a condition, a disease called leprosy. And at that time, there, there, it was an incurable condition. There was no cure. In fact, there was really no way to manage it. It would just worsen and worsen until the person had to live outside of society because it was so contagious. And in time, it would cause just horrible disfigurement to the body. Fingers, toes would be missing. And in time, ears and the ends, the tips of noses would be missing. And people would be horribly disfigured as the end result of this this terrible disease and this is what he has and and with all of his money all of his power all of his prestige nothing can help him he has this incurable condition and so here he is seeking help from the prophet of God and he appears before the prophet or he comes to his home the prophet sends a message out just go Go wash in the Jordan seven times. You'll be clean. But verse 11, his response, but Naaman became furious and went away and said, indeed, I, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the far part of the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Verse 13, and his servants came near and spoke to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says, wash and be clean. And so he went, he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Amen. What, a, what an incredible miracle. What an incredible story. The credit card company, Capital One, they've been asking people for years, what's in your wallet? What's in your wallet? Today, I have a, a much more important question to ask. What's in your bag today? We're going to do a, a spiritual bag check. What's in your bag today? I want to talk to you about this subject, the treasure in two bags of dirt. The treasure in two bags of dirt. Lord, speak to your people today. Encourage us. Strengthen us. Let our faith be resolute in you. And God, let our identity be sure. We know who we are because we know who you are. Thank you, God, for all that you've done in our lives and all you've done in this service. And we thank you in advance for all that is yet to come. I pray that the gift of faith would be in operation today. I pray that there would be workings of miracles today. I pray that gifts of healing would be in operation today. I pray that the gift of prophecy would be uttered today. In the name of the Lord Jesus, have your way in the midst of your church. And you be glorified today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, God bless you. You can be seated today. Amen. So Naaman stands as a very interesting character in the Bible. Very interesting. His story breaks forth suddenly on the pages of Scripture. And then just like that, just like that, he's gone. His life returning to the shadows of ancient history. And though his time on the stage of the biblical narrative is so brief, this Naaman actually leaves an enduring legacy. Because even Jesus discussed Naaman in his teachings. Naaman's great miracle of healing becomes even more profound when we consider who Naaman was. Actually, it's better to consider who he wasn't. He was not a Hebrew. He was not of the faith of Abraham. He was not a child of the Mosaic covenants or promises, or any of that. He, he was not a part of any of the tribes of the family of Israel. He was an outsider. 
And yet he alone, he alone in stark contrast to the thousands of Jews in Israel at that time, he alone received such a miracle in his body as to have his leprosy cleansed and his health restored. That is the point. This is the point that Jesus highlighted about Naaman. In the book of Luke, chapter 4 and 27, Jesus said this, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Wow. The Bible tells us that Naaman was the commander of the Syrian army, a great and honorable man among his people, a man of valor. And when you think about Syria, Syria is a strong nation which often attacked Israel. Syria is an enemy which often afflicted Israel. Syria would be responsible for the deaths of many in Israel. And this Naaman stood as the commander of the Syrian army. Think about it. Who he was and who he wasn't. A man without promise. A man outside of the covenant. A man who stood as not a figurative, but as a literal enemy to the people of God. And really, because of all of this, he's a man with no hope for his incurable condition of leprosy. He has no hope. But one day, upon hearing the testimony of a young Jewish slave girl, as she told about the power of the prophet of Jehovah who resided in Israel. And I think often about this young Jewish slave girl, Brother Bartel, because people say, I don't know how to be a soul winner. I don't know how, how to be bold in my faith. You know what this young slave girl did? She bragged about her pastor. She bragged about her church. It's not hard to be a soul winner. You just got to play tag with someone. You just got to talk about how good God is to you, how good church was on Sunday, the great message your pastor preached. She just got to bragging on her man of God. She got to bragging on her preacher. And she said she heard about Naaman's condition. She heard about the talk in the home, and, and they knew what devastating news this was. And the young girl said, well, you'll just go to my pastor. My pastor will lay hands, and God will heal him. You go to my church. There's miracles at my church. Aren't you glad this morning you're at Christian Life Center, the church uh, where miracles happen? This altar is not a place where we refer you. This is a place where God heals you. It's a place where God delivers you. You want to be a soul winner? Just start bragging about your church. Start bragging about your preacher. Start bragging about your God. So she is bragging. And she says, if my master could only go see the prophet that resides in Israel, I know God would heal him of this condition. So upon hearing her testimony, Naaman began the chain of events that eventually landed him in a chariot in front of Elisha's home. And then Elisha gave the command, as we read this morning, he gave the command for Naaman to wash seven times in the Jordan River to receive his healing. But Naaman was furious that the man of God did not even come out of the house to greet him or to recite some incantation over him, because Naaman thought, surely someone as important as him deserved to have some type of healing ceremony performed, right? He, he was wanting the show and the spectacle, because he's Naaman. And because of his wounded pride, he turned away in anger, determined to go back home to Syria rather than to step one foot into the muddy waters of the Jordan. But thankfully, Naaman's servants were able to calm him down, and they convinced him to follow the prophet's command. So Naaman goes and dips seven times in the Jordan River. And the Bible says, this is amazing, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. God did not just remove the leprosy out of him, okay? God restored the health that he lost, and he actually made it better than it was before. Have you ever brushed the back of your hand against, you know, the, the, the cheek of a new, brand new born baby, and how soft that skin is, or just brush your hand against their, their forearm, how soft it hasn't, their skin hasn't been weathered by the elements yet, not by the sun or the wind. God gave 
name in that kind of skin. Ladies, could you imagine if Walmart sold a lotion that could do that? My goodness, Walmart couldn't keep it in stock. And I think this is an amazing picture of what God does for us. Because when you come to this altar, when you give your life to God, he doesn't just forgive you of your sin. He gives you a brand new life. If many man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Yes, the sins are washed away. But that's not the end of the story. All things are made new. There are testimonies in the house. He didn't just forgive me. He restored me. He didn't just forgive me. He put me back together. He gave me a brand new life life, a, a brand new identity, a brand new name, and a brand new future. That's the God I'm preaching about today. He doesn't just take away the disease. He gives you a brand new life. <laughs> After receiving such an incredible miracle. Naaman tries to offer a gift of appreciation to the prophet, but Elisha refuses. That's very unusual. Preachers don't normally say no to offerings. And Elisha says, nope, not going to take it. At this point, the story takes an odd turn, for Naaman now makes a very unusual request. So let's pick this up in verse 15 of chapter 5. We ended reading on verse 14, so let's keep going in the story. In the very next verse, verse 15, and he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him. He said, indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, as the Lord lives, this is Elisha's response, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And, and I've pondered this. And I think Elisha is making a point here. I think Elisha is making a point about the grace of God. And here is the lesson of grace. You cannot buy God's goodness. And if Naaman were to give this gift and Elisha were to receive it, perhaps Naaman would go home and say, well, I got this miracle. I received this healing because of how much I gave, what, what, what I offered, the, the sacrifice or the gift or the offering that I made. And I want to tell you, you cannot buy your way into heaven. You cannot purchase forgiveness. You cannot purchase salvation. You receive it by the goodness of the grace of God. And sometimes you got to know, God, I have nothing to offer. And he says, that's all right. I have everything to give to you. I have everything to offer you. That's the lesson of grace. We can't earn this, but it's by the goodness of God. So Elisha refuses, and, and Naaman just has to understand that this miracle is because of the goodness of God and nothing that Naaman could do to deserve it himself. When we get to verse 17, so Naaman said, Then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth. For your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Now, it, that word Lord is in all capital letters. And one of the points that we teach in hermeneutics and in our Theology One course, whenever you see the word Lord in all capital letters in the Old Testament, that is the covenant name of God. Jehovah or Yahweh. And he is saying, I will no longer worship any other God. I will only worship Jehovah. Isn't that isn't that just beautiful? So Naaman asked Elisha for two mule loads of dirt to take back to Syria with him. Do I have my two mules in the house today? I, 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 need, I need a couple mules to help me. So here's this mighty man, and he says, can I have two big bags of dirt to take home with me? And so he loads down the mules. We've got some anointed mules in the house today. Perfect. Amen. Give it up for these anointed men of God. Amen. <laughs> Pastor Chris, I don't know if you saw the name on that, but I made sure to bring some miracle grow into the house of God today. We're about to have some miracle growth at Christian Life Center in Jesus' name. 
So he asked for two bags of dirt. Two bags of dirt. And I, and I have to ask the question, why would this mighty military leader, this man of great influence and prestige, this man of great wealth, why would he want two big bags of dirt from the land of Israel? Now, at this point of the story, my imagination takes over. And go there with me. I often think about Naaman's wife at this point of the story. Because she knows he's going to Israel to get his healing. She knows that that's why he's going there. But in the back of her mind, she's thinking, you know, he's going to that far country. And whenever he goes on a business trip, he always brings me back something to let me know he was thinking about me. So surely he's going to come back from Israel with a, with a gift, with, with something to let, to let me know that he was thinking about me on his trip. And she got to thinking, well, what, what, what's Naaman going to bring me back from Israel? She thought to herself, you know, you know, in Israel, the craftsmen, they're very skilled. Perhaps a, a pretty scarf to wear to the royal dinners that she had to attend with her husband. And, and she began to figure out what outfit that scarf would go with. And she's, she's contemplating what would her husband surprise her with when he returned from the land of Israel. And then she thought to herself, you know what? The artisans in Israel, they produce amazing pottery, perhaps a, a beautiful vase for the mantle that she could show off to all their guests. She, and she began to clear the spot on the mantle for that, that vase to go because when, when he's going to bring it home, it's going to have a special place and, and she's going to show it off. Look what my husband brought me. Look, look at what he gave to me. Look at what he brought for me from the land of Israel, and she began to clear a little space. Perhaps it would be a, just a, a beautiful piece of pottery. Really, artwork is what it would be in their home. Then she thought about, you know, the palm dates. Oh, my goodness, in Israel, they're absolutely delicious. And perhaps some of that amazing, delectable date honey. So when I invite all my, my girlfriends over, all my lady friends over, and we have our tea, I can serve some of this honey. Where did you get that? My husband brought it back from Israel. So in her mind, she's just contemplating. She knows he's going to get his healing. She knows that's why he's going. But surely he's thinking of her while he's on his trip. And she's preparing herself. And, and the day comes where, hey, Naaman is returning. And she comes out the house to greet her husband. And here he is. And the procession that's with him. And he's smiling. He's waving. He's so happy. And she's happy to see him. And, and the news report has run ahead of him of his healing. And she's so excited that, that God did this for her husband. She's so excited that he's healed. And, and, and look, look, at, look at what an incredible thing that's happened to her and her family. And she's so happy. And she sees, sees him. And he's happy. And he's smiling. They're still at a distance. And they're waving to one one another but just the joy even at that distance is shared among them and as he draws closer he quickly dismounts from his horse and he runs towards her and they embrace one another's husband and wife and and they're so thankful and they share in this beautiful moment then then he, he separates a little bit and he looks at her and says honey i brought us back something from israel and she's like oh it's that scarf or maybe it's that that beautiful piece of pottery or maybe it's the date honey i'll even serve some today i'll, I'll serve it at lunch he says, honey, come with me. And he brings her over. He's so excited. He grabs her by the hand. And he brings her over. And she tries to keep up. And he says, honey, look what I brought from Israel. And he takes her. And he shows her a bag of dirt. And he's so excited. He, look, I brought, I brought dirt from Israel. And his wife turned away in silence. Went back towards the house and slammed the door. And didn't say another word. And like many husbands before and many husbands after, Naaman said, w was it something I said? <laughs> Why? Why would this great man of prestige and wealth and substance and influence, why would he be so excited about two bags of dirt? But to answer that question, one must first understand the ancient beliefs of the pagan nations that surrounded Israel. Because to many in the ancient world, a god or a deity was tied to a particular landmass or a country or a region. So when one journeyed from one country to another country or one went from one area to another area, then one would fall under the jurisdiction of different gods according to the region he was currently in. And some were gods of war, some were gods that affected the weather, some were gods and goddesses of fertility, some were gods of their herds and their flocks, some were gods of their crops and of their harvest. 
Different regions had different gods with different areas of authority and power. This was the belief of the pagan nations that surrounded Israel. False beliefs, wrong beliefs. But this is what they believed. And so when you would journey from one land to another land, it was common that you were going to pay homage or respect to the god or gods or goddesses of that land. And you would give an offering. You would do something. And, and, and so that your time in their area would be blessed. And this was a common thing that different deities or different gods had authority or jurisdiction or power over different areas. And so this understanding comes into play when one considers the story found in 1 Kings chapter 20. I love this story. Because the Syrians were defeated in battle by the Israelites. And they blamed their defeat on the location of the battle. Go back and read this later today. 1 Kings chapter 20. They, they claimed because the Israelites' God was a God of the hills. But if they were to fight in the valley, then things would be different. Because that's what they believed. Different gods had different power in different areas. So he says, oh, well, he, he defeated us because he's a God of the hills, but our God's God in the valley. So let's fight him next year in the valley and then we'll be victorious. So next year they attacked Israel in the valley and they were again defeated. Why? Because he's not just the God of the hills. He's also the God of the valley. He's God everywhere, all the time, wherever you need him. Hey, friend, there's no limitations. There's no limitations. The enemy may attack you in the hill. God will show up in the hills. The enemy may, may attack you in the valley. God will show up in the valley. Why? He's God everywhere, all the time. You need to understand something about your God. There is no limitation. There is no limitation. He is the God of all the earth. There is no limitation. There is no restriction to your God. Mm. But understand, this is the perspective. This wrong, incorrect perspective is what Naaman brings into the story that as he travels to the land of Israel he's now coming under the jurisdiction of a different God a healing God who might be able to reverse his condition so at this point of the story Naaman is not confessing that Jehovah is the only God to Naaman Jehovah is just another God of another land worshiped by another people yet after the miracle takes place Naaman makes a wonderful confession what does he say in verse 15? Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. After he experiences the power of God, Naaman confesses that Jehovah alone is God and there is no other God except the God of Israel. And friend, I want to tell you, it's the eternal truth that will never lose its power. Deuteronomy 6.4 says it like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We preach it, we proclaim it, we celebrate it. Make no mistake, this is a one God church. It is the eternal truth that will never lose its power. There is only one God. And after his miracle, Naaman became a one God believer. He became a one God worshiper. Worshiper. He came to confess there's only one God. The God of Israel, Jehovah, is the only true God. Maybe you're not convinced today. Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6 says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. I wish I was in an apostolic church today. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. I don't come with some new weird message. I come with an ancient message. There's only one God. There's only one God. There's one creator. There's one Lord. There's one King. There's one almighty God that sits on the throne of the universe. There is only one God. Oh, and I love this next one. James 2, 19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. Hey, if you're a one God believer, you're doing well and you're doing right. Then he says, the devils also believe and tremble. You want to get the devil scared today? You remind him that the one true God is your God. Remind him who you serve. Remind him who your king is. You want to see the devil tremble and back up? You remind him that you serve the only king, the only Lord. You serve the one true and living living God. Oh, 
So Naaman now understands this truth that you and I confess today, that there is only one God. There's not a committee of gods. There's not a plurality of gods. There is only one God. However, with this confession, Naaman still reveals that even though he now believes that Jehovah is the only true God, in his mind, Jehovah is tied to the land of Israel. Because listen again to his confession. If you listen to his confession, you would see it. This is what he said. Indeed, now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Even though he confesses that Jehovah is the only God, and the only God that he will ever worship or serve the rest of his life, in his mind, Jehovah is still tied to this region, this landmass, this area. He, Jehovah is tied. We could say it this way. Jehovah is trapped or limited to only being Jehovah, to only being powerful, to only being God in this region. That, that's, that's his misunderstanding. So even though he's confessing that there's only one God, Naaman somehow continues to think that Jehovah and his power are linked to the land area known as the nation of Israel. And now it all makes sense. Now we see why he wanted two big bags of dirt. Because he wanted to continue worshiping the one true God. And to do so, he felt like he had to bring some of the nation of Israel with him. So wherever Naaman would spread that dirt, it would change that area from being Syrian land to becoming Israelite land. And thus the one true God, Jehovah, could be manifested wherever that Israelite dirt was placed. Isn't that amazing? Now we know that Naaman was ignorant in his understanding of how God operates. We know that. God isn't trapped God isn't limited by the boundaries of a nation. So Naaman was ignorant in his understanding. Now, I may be wrong about this. I may be wrong. I've been wrong about a lot in life. I've been married 26 years. I've been told that many times. No, that was a terrible joke. Sorry, baby. Now, I may be wrong about this, but there was something special. Or let me say it this way. Maybe, just maybe, in my opinion, there really is nothing special that is conveyed in those two bags of dirt. To me, there was nothing special about Israelite dirt that would somehow convey the presence of God with it. At the end of the day, this is my opinion, it's just dirt. It's my opinion. Yet there is something admirable, something noble, something so special about what Naaman was attempting to do. In my mind, they're just bags of dirt. And God's not going to travel in a bag of dirt. Yet there is something so noble and honorable and special about what Naaman is attempting to do. Because think about it. His theology was wrong, but his desire was right. He had a wrong thinking about God, but his heart was in the right place. He just wanted the presence of God with him for the rest of his life. In his limited understanding of God, he was trying to include God in his life, a life that would be lived far from the prophet and the land of his miracle. He said, I don't know the next time I'm going to come to Israel. and I don't want to leave this experience in Israel. I don't know the next time I'm going to see the man of God. I don't want to leave this experience. So he said, I, I want to bring the God of Israel with me. So to bring the God of Israel with me, I've got to bring a little bit of Israel with me. That was his mentality. That was his motivation in doing what he did. He just wanted to take God with him wherever he went. And so whenever Naaman wanted to encounter God, he just reached into one of those bags of dirt and he would spread that dirt around, and he would stand on that dirt, and he would call upon the God of his miracle. He would call upon Jehovah God. When his children were sick, he would spread that dirt around and call upon Jehovah. When his marriage was in trouble, he spread that dirt around 
and called upon Jehovah. When his finances were in trouble, he spread that dirt around and called upon Jehovah. When his boss was giving him problems at work, he spread that dirt around and called upon Jehovah. When everything in his life was going wrong, he didn't respond in fear. He responded in faith because he had two bags of dirt. And as long as he had that dirt, he knew I can have an encounter with the God of my miracle, the God of my blessing, the God who loves me and the God that I love with all my heart. His theology was wrong, but friend, I want to tell you, his desire was right. He said, if I know I ever need to encounter God, I know what to do. So from that day forward, he never responded in fear, but he knew how to respond in faith because in his mind, he always had access to God. Because to name it, those two bags contain more than just dirt. You see, the dirt in those bags represented his access to God. From that day forward, whenever he had a need in his life, he also had a response because of the treasure in his two bags of dirt. But what about you? What about you? What do you do when you need a miracle? What do you do when you need an answer? What do you do when your mind is confused and your heart is broken? When your life is in shambles and when your faith is almost gone? And we've all been there. Don't act all high and mighty today. We've all been there. What do you do when you're in a mess of a situation and there seems like there's no way out? What do you do? What do you do when the doctor's report has come? And there is no hope for recovery. What do you do? What do you do when the finances dry up? And the bills pile up and all the doors are closed. What do you do, friend? When that loved one has decided to walk a path that is contrary. That is against everything this book stands for. What do you do? What do you do when it seems like the enemy has won? And you don't have the strength to stay in the fight one moment longer. Are you listening to me today? What do you do in those moments? Naaman had two bags of dirt that he was going to always use to bring God into his situation. But what about you? What will you use to bring God into your situation. You see, just like Naaman, you have a bag today. But my question is, what is in your bag of faith today that will cause you to have access to God when you need him most? What's in your bag today? So Naaman... He had his two bags of dirt. But friend, if you're an apostolic believer today, I'm convinced you have some treasures that are much greater than Naaman's dirt. So let me ask the question again. What's in your bag today? What's in your bag of faith today? So let me see what I have here today in this this wonderful, wonderful bag today. Let me see what, what might I have as an apostolic believer when I need God in my situation. You see, I have something. I have something that is priceless. I have something money cannot buy. You see, as an apostolic believer, I've got the word to stand on. I've got the word to stand on. I want you to think about this. Everything we are, everything we believe, everything we preach, everything we teach, everything that we stand for, our identity, everything we are, everything that we believe is based on the word of God. Christian Life Center is not a church that preaches opinion. 
Christian Life Center is not a church that's going to teach some historical theology that was concocted somewhere in the Middle Ages. But we go back to the source. What does the book say? What does the book say? What does the book say? Friend, everything we are, everything we do, we base it upon the Word of God. We stand on His Word. We proclaim His Word. We preach His Word. We pray His Word. We believe His Word with everything that's inside of us. Friend, if I need God in my situation, I can bring God into my situation by bringing His Word into my my situation. I can open that book and say, what does God say? I know what the doctor said, but what does God say? I know what the economy says, but what does God say? I know what the government says, but what does God say? I know what my backslidden child says, but what does God say? Because everything we are, everything we have, we stand upon the word of God. Listen to me today. I can bring God into any situation by bringing his word into that situation. Isaiah 55, 11, one of my favorite verses in all of scripture. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. When God gave this message, the people were doubting. They said, there's no way God can restore us. We're trapped in Babylon. We're trapped in captivity. There's no way that Jerusalem will be rebuilt. There's no way that the walls will be raised up. There's no way that there's going to be a temple again where we're going to worship Jehovah. And God said, when I give you a promise, you need to understand the power of my my word so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void God said my word can't come back empty my word has to do what I send it to do and it shall accomplish that which I please then look at this next statement and it shall prosper I love that word prosper because I don't believe God wants to give you a halfway miracle and a halfway blessing but when there's prosperity there's an overabundance of the goodness of God friend if you need the goodness of of God get his word into your situation because his word is going to prosper in your life at Christian Life Center we are not shy we are not embarrassed everything we are we proclaim this book and the words of this book if you need God get a hold of his word today Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord. Mm. And look at this. And like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. I'm not talking about some little dinky little hammer. I'm talking about a great big sledgehammer. That's the word of God. And when you've got that boulder of opposition in front of you. Brother Lopez, you don't know my situation. Oh, but I know the word. Brother Lopez, you don't know what I'm facing, but I know the word. And the Bible says that his word is like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. You may have to hit that rock more than once, but you pick up the hammer of the word of God and you say, boulder of opposition, how dare you defy me? How dare you get in my way? I'm about to have revival. I'm about to have a breakthrough. I'm about to have a move of God. I'm going to see my family saved. I'm going to see my children restored. God's putting my home back together and I speak to this boulder of opposition. I've got the hammer of the word and I'm going to break you. I'm going to crush you. You're going to get out of my way because I'm standing uh, on the word. We are living in a crazy, crazy hour. Opinions are shifting left and right. One thing it's this and the next day it's that and, and, and just views and positions and, and the moral mores of society have absolutely shifted and what is wrong is now right and what is right is now wrong and, and the world, the sands is just shifting all over the place. But friend, you and I don't have to be unsettled. Psalm 119.89 Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. 
I don't care about the opinions coming through media, coming through the news, coming through political parties. I don't even care about the messaging of the government because I've got a sure word to stand on. The word may turn upside down, but this word is forever settled. The world may turn upside down, but this word is unmovable. It's not going anywhere. It is forever, friend. Don't put your faith in a building. Put your faith in the word. Don't put your faith in an organization. Put your faith in the word. Put your faith in the word of God that will stand the test of time. Turn to someone and say, hey, I'm apostolic. Woo, God is good. I said God is good. I feel like someone wants to clap. I feel like someone wants to rejoice. I feel like someone wants to act a little Pentecostal this morning. Come on, this is a Bible preaching church. This is a word believing church. Hallelujah. 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 All right. So that I know that's one treasure I got in my bag. But what else do I got? What, I'm an apostolic believer. What other treasures? I know Naaman had his two bags of dirt. But what else do I have as an apostolic believer? What, what do I got in here? Oh, ooh. Oh, this is a good one. I like this one. Ooh, this is a good one. You, you ain't ready for this. You can't handle this. Uh-uh. Uh, you just come back next week. I'll, I'll pr- oh, you want it now? I don't know if you can handle it. Friend, the old song says it like this. I've got the Holy Ghost down in my soul, just like the Bible says. Friend, this is a spirit-filled church. (laughs) This is a Holy Ghost church. I know what you thought you were coming to today. This is a Holy Ghost church. This is a Holy Ghost church. This is a Holy Ghost church. Let me tell you a story, because I, I love church. I really do love church. I, I don't find excuses to not go to church. I find reasons to go to church. I love church. I really do. I love church. And one day, it was a Friday, and men's retreat was starting that night, Brother Kenny. And this is back when I had my little f- white Ford Ranger pickup truck back in the day. And I was the pastor on call on Friday. I had some things to do here down in the valley, take care of some things. And I had to get up the mountain because I wasn't going to miss men's retreat. And I'm driving, and I'm driving a little quickly to get up there. And I'm looking at the clock, and I'm gauging. I'm realizing I'm going to get there right about the time church is starting. In fact, probably going to be a few minutes late. But I'm driving to get up there. I I just, man, men's retreat, it's incredible. It's life-changing. I'm not going to miss it. And I get up there, and I pull up my truck, and I had to park a little, little ways away, not too far, I had to park a little ways away. And, and it's chilly up in the mountains, you know, where we typically go up in Sonora. It's chilly. And, and I open the door, and I open the door. I could hear the sounds of church. You know, that, you know what it sounds like? Church was going on. There was singing. There was clapping. And even though I couldn't see it, I knew there was dancing. I knew there was running. I could hear the shouts of victory. They were having church, and they were having good church. And I open my, my truck door, and I can hear it over off in the sanctuary, the, that, that, the, what we use as the sanctuary up there at Old Oak Ranch, and I, and I can hear it. So I quickly reach behind my seat. I grab my coat, and I grab my Bible, shut my door, and I turn. And I turn, and I just start running to church, running, full-on running, Bible in one hand, coat in the other. I'm running, and about halfway, Brother Wiley, between my truck and the sanctuary building, I, this thought comes, why are you running? Eli, you're a full-grown man. As grown as ever is going to be, okay? As grown. <laughs> it wasn't that funny. It was not that funny. I don't appreciate that. We're going to talk after church. <laughs> but if you would have saw me, you would have thought a bear was chasing me. Or I mean, I am running. I'm, I'm, 
Woo! And as I asked the question, a half a second later, the answer came. I'm running because I love church. I don't want to miss church. I don't want them to take one lap without me. I don't want them to sing one more chorus without me. If they're dancing, I want to dance. If they're shouting, I want to shout. I love church. I love coming to church. I love singing, clapping. I love the preaching. I love the altar. I love everything about church. I love church. But you know what? I can't be in church all the time. As much as I love it, as much as I love being here, and as much as I love being with all of you and, and feeling what I'm feeling, that, why we can't live here 24-7. We've got responsibilities. There's things to do. There's a life to live. Bills to be paid. you got to go to work. i take care of the kids and all that stuff. There's life. We can't be at church 24-7. And I love church because I know I can have a move of God here. I know can, I can experience the power of God here. I know that if I come in in a weak condition, the power of God can touch me at church and I can leave strong, renewed, strengthened. I love church, but I can't be at church all day, every day. But if you have the Holy Ghost, mm, you don't have to leave church at church. You don't have to leave a move of God at church. Woo! Somebody knows what I'm preaching about today. Man, I feel it. I feel it. I, it's like a fire stirring up inside of me. If you've got the Holy Ghost, have no fear. Wherever you go, there's a move of God about to break out. If you've got the Holy Ghost, wherever you go, there is the potential for God's power to be released and unleashed. I thought I was in a Holy Ghost church, Pastor Villanueva. I'm talking if you're a Holy Ghost filled believer, you don't have to leave the move of God here. You don't have to leave the touch of God here. You don't have to leave the presence of God here. Think about it. You may find yourself in a dead, dry, barren desert of a situation. It may be a situation without life and without hope. But if you've got the Holy Ghost, when you begin releasing the flow of what's inside of you, something happens in the atmosphere. Because Jesus said, he that believeth on me, as the scripture at the word hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers, plural, rivers. Woo! Not just at church, not just on Sunday morning, not just at men's retreat or ladies advance or youth camp uh, or lifeline conference, uh, not just at landmark friend. If you've got the Holy Ghost uh, out of your belly shall flow rivers, not just at chapel on a Wednesday morning, but I want to tell you got the Holy Ghost. You've got access to the power of God. You've got access to life. You've got access to the miraculous. That's what you have uh, when you have the Holy Ghost. I, I love how loud church is. I, I, I love it. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost that the, the, the sound filled the house. It was noisome on the day of Pentecost. And people who don't like loud church, you probably wouldn't have liked the day of Pentecost. And when I read about heaven, there's going to be rejoicing and praise in heaven. I'm not talking about being obnoxious. But when the Holy Ghost gets to moving, I just can't keep quiet. I just got to let it out. And when I begin to move in the Holy Ghost, the atmosphere changes. Have you noticed how the atmosphere changes when you begin to pray in tongues? Have you noticed when you begin to pray in that heavenly language, the atmosphere around you changes because you're releasing the flow out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. You can't keep it quiet. You can't keep it down. But you know what? Sometimes it's not conducive to be all loud and exuberant like we are right here. Right? I have been sitting in the doctor's office. Oh, I've been there. 
when the stress of getting my master's degree and the stress of getting the college accredited tore apart my body. They couldn't figure out what was going on inside of me. And when they're throw, throwing around scary words like cancer, and we've got to run more tests, and we don't know what's going on inside of you, and parts of my body are not functioning correctly anymore, and you're there in the doctor's office wondering what kind of a report am I going to get when I walk in there, I've learned I can sit in that doctor's office in that waiting room, and I can begin to release the flow. They don't know what's going on around me, but I'm having a move of God right there. Under my breath, I'm speaking in those tongues. Under my breath, I'm flowing in the Holy Ghost. I, I want to tell you there's not one situation where you have to live outside of the presence of God. If you've got the Holy Ghost, take God with you. You are a walking move of God. You are a walking breakthrough. You are a walking revival. You've got to understand what you have. Uh, I remember sitting when my son, oldest son, was in speech therapy had 10% speech intelligibility, very non-communicative, not knowing what to do. It was a dark time for my wife and I, wondering what's going to happen with our child. And I would sit there while, while they're doing speech therapy and doing all that they knew to do. I would sit there and I learned how to have a move of God in a crowded waiting room. I learned how to sit there. And friend, I want to tell you, it works. Because uh, one day I was driving. I said, Avery, does anyone ever tell you talk too much? He said, just you, dad, the kid that couldn't talk. The lady came out one day, said, there's nothing more I I can do he's beyond me what happened I begin to release the flow of the Holy Ghost uh, into that situation you may look like it's it may look like it's impossible to you but do you know what you have do you know what you have access to do you know what you're plugged into you have the Holy Ghost And let me give you some advice. Let me give you some advice. Back when, when I started plugging into this, I would drive down the road and have moves of God. And people thought I was losing my mind. But now every car has Bluetooth in it. So they just think you're in an animated conversation. When you're driving down the road, why don't you turn off Fox News? Why don't you turn off MSNBC? Why don't you turn off all those talking heads? And why don't you plug into God? A great way to pray is in that car on the way to work, uh, on that car on the way home, on that car on the way to the store, on that car coming to church. Uh, you can have a move of God. You can walk into church uh, already full of the Holy Ghost uh, because of the prayer meeting you had before you ever got here. Don't think you're just going to have a move of God at church. You have the Holy Holy Ghost. <laughs> Ephesians 3.20, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Whoa, we get excited. That's our God. But look at the, the statement, how it continues. According to the power that worketh in us. Your God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Let me make it simple. Ain't nothing too hard for God. Ain't nothing impossible. Ain't no situation too big. God is not intimidated by what you're facing today. He's not intimidated by your trial or your storm. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power. I've got the Holy Ghost. I've got the Holy Ghost. I've got the Holy Ghost. Which means I have access to his power. Acts 1 verse 8, but ye shall receive goosebumps. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But you shall receive a good feeling after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But you shall have holy heartburn. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Hey, I'm thankful for the good feeling in all of our hearts. And I'm thankful for the goosebumps and the chills that go up and down my spine when I feel the presence of God and the angels fill the sanctuary. But friend, I got more than goosebumps and a good feeling. I've got power. You've got power. That's what the Holy Ghost brings. You have power in the Holy Ghost. Does anyone have the Holy Ghost here today? Then you have power. 
If you've got the Holy Ghost, uh, you have power. I want someone just for a few moments, uh, I want you just to let it out. Uh, that Holy Ghost that's inside of you, if you need to stand, stand. Uh, but go ahead uh, and let it out. Uh, stir up the gift uh, that is within you this morning. You've got the Holy Ghost. Uh, act like it. Now, some Christians will tell you, hey, we too have the Bible. And some Christians will tell you, hey, we, we too have the Holy Spirit. What makes you apostolic so different? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Because there's another treasure in this bag. A treasure that we celebrate here at Christian Life Center. A treasure that's not for sale at any price. A treasure that we proclaim, a treasure that we herald. Hey, don't be preaching my message ahead of me. A treasure that means so much. A treasure that is priceless. A great treasure, a powerful treasure, a mighty treasure. You see, at Christian Life Center, we're not shy and we're not embarrassed because we understand. Mm, 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 mm. We understand. Woo, woo. Uh, we understand that there is a name. That there is a name. I said, there is a name. There is a name. There is a name. I said there is a name. Philippians chapter 2 says it like this, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Your enemy has to bow when you use that name. Those demons have to bow when you use that name. That disease has to bow. Cancer and diabetes has to bow when you use that name. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Friend, I'm not preaching religion. I'm preaching a name that is above every name. I don't come as some traditional Christian. I'm an apostolic believer. I have the name. We're going to have miracles today. We're going to have healing today. We're going to have deliverance today. Mark chapter 16, verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Any believers in the house today? Any believers in the balcony? Any believers in the house today? And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. I don't care what's been attacking your home. I don't care what's been attacking your family. I've got a name that'll drive out every demon. There is a name that every devil is scared of. In the name of Jesus, I speak freedom and deliverance to your home today. I speak blessing over your family today. In the name of Jesus, we drive Drive back every demonic force in Jesus' name. You jump to verse 18. 
It says, in my name, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We're going to get some testimonies today because in a few moments, we're going to open this altar. And if you're sick, we're going to lay hands and we're not going to say some religious formula. We're going to say, in the name. 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 name. In the name of Jesus. Woo! Tell you what's going to happen today. We got some baptistry tanks back behind me. And there's going to be some souls after this service. They're going to walk up there to be baptized. And you're not going to hear. I'm stepping on my treasure. You're not going to hear some religious formula that was cooked up in some theological book somewhere. Uh -uh -uh -uh. But a man of God is going to stand and say, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. Why are you going to do that, Brother Lopez? Because Acts chapter 4, verse 12 is very clear. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We preach in the name. We pray in the name. We lay hands in the name. We sing in the name. We baptize in the name because salvation, salvation, salvation is in the name. So what do you do when you need a miracle? I know what I have. I've got a bag. And in that bag, I've got some treasures. I've got the word of God that is quick and powerful. I've got the Holy Ghost that brings power and brings life. And then, as an apostolic believer, I have a name that covers my life. I have a name that is above every name. The name of Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Do you feel that right now? There is power in the name of Jesus. You know what I want to do right now? I want to shake the spiritual atmosphere of Stockton, of this valley, this state, and this nation, this world. I want to shake it. And we're going to do it right here in Stockton, California. Because in the next few moments, we're going to shout the name of Jesus together. And angels will stand at attention. And demons will tremble and flee. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. Are you ready? Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Are you ready? On the count of three, I want you to shout the name of Jesus with everything that you have, and you're going to feel the atmosphere change. Are you ready? One, two, three. If I could have our musicians, our praise team be ready to minister. 
Thank you for staying with me. I've taken a little time this morning, but I appreciate you staying with me. Because I believe we're about to see the miraculous released into this service. God wanted me to remind you of who you are because of what you believe. Mm. So what do you do when you need God in your situation? You see, Naaman knew what to do. He would grab some of that dirt. And he would spread it around everywhere he needed God to be manifest. Everywhere he needed the power of God. Everywhere he needed an encounter with God. He grabbed some of that dirt. He guarded that dirt. He protected that dirt. And whenever he needed to encounter God from that day forward, he would spread that dirt around. And when he stood upon that dirt, he had this this thought, this concept. That now I can encounter God friend in your bag of faith you've got some treasures today you need to reach in there and grab the word and spread it around Mm, mm, mm. you've got the Holy Ghost quit keeping it locked up on the inside you got to let that out you got to release the flow of the river ah hallelujah spring up oh well spring up oh well spring up oh well Mm. That's it. Reach over right now and share that current of anointing with somebody near you. God is doing something right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's happening right now. That's it. Reach over. Keep praying in the spirit. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out today. If you have a need, get to this altar right now. If you need a healing in your body, get to this altar. If there's a need in your family, get to this altar. There's ministry taking place right here. If your finances are wrecked, get to this altar. In the name of the Lord Jesus, come down here with your hands raised. We're standing on the word today. We're moving in the Holy Ghost today. And then some men of God, some women of God, they're going to come lay hands on you. And they're going to say in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, if you've never been baptized, we're ready to baptize you today. In the name of Jesus. 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 That's it, ministers. Begin to lay hands. That's it, elders. Receive your blessing. Receive your healing. It's the one I run to. That's it. Receive your deliverance. There is just one Come on, this altar's open. There's testimonies coming out of this service. Jesus. It's changing. Jesus. It's changing right here, right now. Your story's changing. Your situation's changing. That's an apostolic believer. Stand on the word. That's an apostolic believer. Flow in the Holy Ghost. That's an apostolic believer. Proclaim that name. That is above every name.
Your name. 